that you're well. Um, I've got a few people on stage, it's very exciting. Okay. Obviously, everyone already knows Eugenio very well, so <laughs> no introduction needed there. Um, we've also got, going down the line, Gemma as well. Ooh, you should have flipped, really, you know. <laughs> meant to put it in the right order. I think they might gone wrong. <laughs> I think you can hopefully tell who's who. So Gemma is um, partner of AV Delivery at Dentsu Aegis. It's one of the largest media agencies um, in the UK. Um, working across all AV, including TV, audio, and of course her passion point, radio. Very important. Um, next we'll go to Julia. So Julia is the media strategy lead for UK and Europe for Sky. Uh, Julia works multimedia as well and looks at the role in media versus other channels um, through an effectiveness lens. So lots to dig into there. And last but not least, we've got Kenneth. Hi, Kenneth. Um, Kenneth joins us as the VP and Head of Radio at Viaplay Group, which has eight Norwegian radio stations. Correct me if that's wrong. No, that's spot on. Okay, good. And um, a streaming platform and over 30 years experience in the industry, so he's definitely going to teach us a thing or two. We've got a lot to talk about within this topic. Um, so just to give you a quick introduction into what's been going on um, in the last couple of years. So audio has been booming across Europe since 2020. Um, there's been huge demand for content, um, basically soaring with many people turning to radio and audio, digital audio, for companionship and entertainment, lifting the mood throughout the pandemic. Interestingly, there are nuances within each market as well and what's resonating the most. So for example, podcast-wise in the UK, comedy was top, second was football or sport in general, and actually females tend to prefer true crime, so there's something interesting going on there. Whereas in France, apparently the top four are culture, social, education and news, so clearly much more highbrow, <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting. Um, so yesterday when we caught up, we discussed how there's a need to separate out radio and digital audio. There are big differences in the patterns which are emerging. And just to give you a quick overview from a global number perspective, numbers are tracking, um, so global numbers are tracking in line with UK and Europe. We can see that spends differ significantly between radio and digital audio, but they're all on the rise. Digital audio increased by 33.9% in 2021 in spend, whereas radio increased by a really impressive 8.4% year on year. And then forecasts for 2022, two are increasing as well. Online audio, 25%, and radio over 4%. So some really great growth numbers. But what I want to do is dig into the detail of it. So let's get started. So audio has been booming is quite a big statement. So first of all, Kenneth, it would be great to know from you the, the growth you've seen in your local market mm -hmm. um, and what you, why you think it's been so strong. Yeah. Well, uh, the Norwegian uh, market is is uh, is uh, Bauer and uh, and us basically. So it's it's a um, it's a market where we only have two players. Uh, last year, the commercial radio business in Norway uh, grew with almost twenty five percent, which I think we need to go back to nineteen ninety four uh, to, to you know find <clears throat> find similar growth. So it's uh, it's uh, by far the medium that uh, has outgrown all of our traditional peers, uh, but also really up there with the digital um, medias and the growth there. And I think uh, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting and surprising, you know, because I don't think radio has changed overnight. I think radio at the core is, we have been tinkering with technology, of course, and, and, and delivery, but, but at, at its, its core, it's the same thing that we have been doing all the time. It's great companionship, it's music, it's news, it's entertainment, and, and that is radio today as well. But of course, the thing that has happened, and I think uh, the thing that really um, uh, drove the growth, at least in the Nordics and in the Norwegian market, is podcasting has made uh, radio and audio sexy again. Uh, and, and, and really, and, and I kind of agree with what was said here earlier, that radio, I don't think radio has a bad reputation, but I think radio is taught less of uh, than what it actually is. Mm. So, uh, so podcasting has made audio as a such and rubbed off on radio and made it sexy again and made it the awareness uh, much higher, at, uh, especially on the buyer side. 
And, um, and I also think um, the uh, rapid decline of television. I mean, the viewership on television is just declining really, really strong in the Norwegian, or at least all of the Nordics, and, and basically across, across the world, and makes television a lot less uh, efficient and, and more expensive. So those two uh, are the things I would point to um, to see that kind of growth in, in the radio markets. Yeah, definitely agree on the sexiness of podcasts drawing in the younger I think crowd. radio's always been radio's always been booming in the UK. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, podcasts and stuff like that are growing. But in the UK, linear radio is it's still the bread and butter. People are still tuning into linear radio. And as we discussed yesterday, you know, I'm a massive radio listener. I listen to Radio X all day and I listen to it through an Alexa. So from a buying point of view, I'm consuming digital audio. From my point of view, I'm consuming linear radio, traditional linear radio. Um, so I think that podcasting is great and it's growing and getting people that don't usually listen to commercial radio in the UK. But radio's always been booming here. Oh, and it, it, you know, rage hour after rage hour, um, we just see consistently strong figures and consistently decent ROI for clients as well from it. I agree. Um, Eugenio, what about in Italy? No, um, in Italy, yes, as also Mara makes some uh, slide about the growing of the, the audio, it's growing fastly, fast also in Europe and also in Italy. But uh, I would like to say something. Uh, this is a point, uh, when I see uh, this kind of uh, revolution, I agree that uh, we are uh, discussing now about audio, and audio is important because uh, uh, it's a way, a way that you can use some content in a passive mode the respect of, of the television. And um, uh, there are many opportunities in terms of people that can uh, start to say something to the, the user that can grow up and become a community. A community means that a small community. But I think that it's important to make uh, a, a difference between radio and audio. I mean that uh, all kind of experience that are uh, on demand uh, at the end uh, are, are not radio. Radio is something that comes from 100 years and uh, is created by, uh, ch have changed the, the, the history of our life uh, and uh, we will continue to do that because make a community around the people, around the brand uh, and the very important point that we have to take in the mind that is radio is now. What is live uh, is something that is broadcast in this moment for all of the users that are listening to the content. It's like a, a, so a soccer match. You can see it on, on demand later, or some even sport, or a concert. But it's something that you see in another moment, and it, each of you uh, consume the content in a different moment. Radio is now. And I think that uh, it's a very important concept. And we, we have to distinguish, make a distinction about audio and radio. Radio is something different. It's a part of the audio ecosphere, but it's different. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to differentiate. Um, Julia, last but not least, sorry. Um, so how does effectiveness in different nations in Europe compare, and why do you think that is? What's your experience of audio? Yeah, so I think um, radio and audio in general is, is a really powerful medium. It always has been. Um, you know, we measure across um, the performance across different parts of the funnel, all the way from awareness consideration to sales. And I think um, it's, it's always been a really important format, and particularly the innovation within uh, radio has, has meant that it, it's still, you know, it's still as important as ever to, to use it. Where we've seen um, incredible sort of um, return on marketing investment and um, sort of amazing CPA numbers is um, for podcasts and for digital audio. Um, I think potentially the UK is a bit more ahead in terms of our um, media usage of digital audio and podcasts, but um, you know we've we've been increasing spend um, in those specific areas, and um, even in in sort of spot radio as well, um, we we've been sort of seeing really good performance across kind of the last two years with COVID. So um, I think it's been really exciting. Um, I think the specific area that we're really excited about is um, some of those longer term partnerships mm -hmm. with, with some of our radio channels. So I think um, uh, at the end of last year, we, Sky launched um, Sky Glass, which is um, our, our new TV set. 
Um, so we, we now produce a TV. And um, I think radio partnerships, those long-term partnerships, have been absolutely critical at driving sort of advocacy for the brand, um, driving comprehension and understanding um, of the product. So um, we've seen really sort of great success, and, and we're launching in Europe um, uh, later, later this year in Italy and Germany with the same product. So um, it's, it's a core part of our strategy, and, and, and we, we really sort of... Um, we believe that through our measurement, it, it, drive ad, it drives advocacy for the brand. Um, I think generally speaking, the, the, the return on marketing investment is strong across all markets. I think it's probably stronger in, in Germany. That's one of our biggest markets, just because I think it's potentially a bit more of a traditional um, market. So spot radio performs really well um, alongside print and some of, some of those other more traditional channels. Whereas in the UK, we really see podcasts and digital audio working really well for us. It's really interesting to see the difference between two, but also really reassuring to hear that, you know, if you're getting good ROI, that is going to lead to further growth, you know, so that's the, ultimately one of the most important things, proof is in the pudding. Um, Gemma, I won't skip you out, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what have you seen in the UK? We've spoken about it a little bit, but how does it compare to other channels as well? Because you've got that lens. So I know that like, it's the same here with TV in that, you know, COVID TV viewing kind of grew because nobody had anything else to do. Um, but then because of the lack of being able to get decent programming produced, you know, now we're seeing a massive decline because the content's not there. Um, across all media owners, I would say that, you know, at the minute, um, I think the one that, thing that's holding up is obviously live sport. Um, but other than that, you know, your Saturday night viewing on ITV has massively declined. And I think the issue is, is if, if, if people aren't watching Saturday night TV anymore, how do you get them back to doing that? Because once you step out of it and then try to go back to it, it almost becomes depressing. Mm. But whereas, you know, radio, the relationship with radio has still kind of been there. You know, people are still consuming breakfast radio. They're still consuming that talent. You know, we did see obviously a growth um, in mid mornings because people are kind of listening. So the shape of it changed slightly, but it's still been the same as it always has. And I think it's really important for, you know, radio media owners and, and, and audio to kind of really focus on the content and the talent to give that listener the best experience possible. You know, uh, you know, I know how it works. I buy radio, I work in radio, but I still consume it still think DJs are my best pals, never met them, which is ridiculous, but I grew up with radio, you know, I grew up where it was listening to long wave radio Atlantic 252, and I still remember answering the phone to competitions, and my gran being really confused, because that's how you have to answer the phone, um, so I just think that from a radio and audio point of view, content's really important more than ever, especially as the TV media owners will start to up their game a bit more with content, and now they can get back out there and start producing it. Totally agree. And actually, on the friends thing, I feel like James A. Caster and a gamble and my mates. Like, I literally yeah. refer to them as my friends from yeah. podcasts. I think Chris and Wells is my best pal. Yeah, exactly. met the man. <laughs> <laughs> Probably um, won't be able to now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. Um, so... There's lots of um, different exciting developments. We've already heard from Eugenio on Radio Player, which is amazing, which is a big game changer. So what do you think is the most exciting development in Europe or your market recently? And it could have over overcome a barrier to audio in general. Um, is there anything which springs to mind? I'll go to Julia first, if that's OK. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of exciting developments from connected cars. There's, there's, there's so many kind of exciting things. I think. Before we kind of go into that, the, bit, the biggest trend, I think, has obviously been the digitalisation um, with, within audio um, and specifically sort of digital targeting um, through programmatic buying. So I think for us, that's, that's been an absolutely massive um, part, piece of innovation that has really kept radio as, and, and digital audio um, as, as a you know, top of mind um, channel. So, um, you know, we can now um, target based on sort of highly contextual um, information, whether that's based on the weather or the time of day or um, what, what music people are selecting and their mood um, and, their, and their sort of personal preferences. So um, I think that's exciting. And we've, we've worked with um, some partners like Zaxxis to integrate um, our own audience segmentation based on sort of behavioral attitudes to things like TV and broadband and mobile to 
um, really sort of hone in and target um, customers um, to upgrade and, and sort of really kind of specific um, messages going out to those audiences. So I think that's been sort of probably the most sort of exciting um, development for, for us. Um, yeah. Does anyone else want to add to that? Because I know it's a big yeah, topic. It's a big one. If I can, yeah. I, very, very fast. I don't know how many people here work for radio, but uh, there is something that we are doing uh, all together uh, in Europe, but worldwide. The project is a radio player. Uh, the point is that uh, we are talking about experience. Uh, and uh, some of the devices, uh, some of the uh, objects that we use every day, like the car, is become a device. So internally, into the dashboard, will be not the volume like this, but will be a screen uh, with the experience. What we are trying to do is because we cannot work uh, alone as a brand, uh, our brand, or Italy. We are working together, and Radio Player is the building where all the radio stay in, and we are trying to create uh, the new experience that will be a common experience for the radio of the future. What is important is that uh, will be not only a technical uh, project, uh, but will be something that involves all the person that work in the radio, because uh, we can win the battle with the new player only if we stay together in terms of content, in terms of experience. So it's important to join in and uh, be part of the success of this uh, new project. Yeah. Now, just to add on what uh, Julia is saying, that uh, for sure, I think the data-driven and targeted uh, audio uh, solution also for, for linear radio when it goes to IP, uh, that is uh, the most exciting thing happened, uh, happening for radio in many years, and I, I think radio as an industry has been really lagging behind on the digital part. So, so that is something that we uh, are pushing really hard for. But of course, it's dependent on listening, moving to IP platforms. And that is something that, at least in most markets, are taking some time. So, so at, at the moment, that's a, a, a limited uh, space, so to say, but, uh, but for sure. Um, targeted uh, ads, personalized um, ads into IP streams. That's the uh, way forward for a lot of um, uh, radio ads. Yeah. yeah, I would say there's probably a lot of there's a lot of opportunity for for this technology. So making it a more immersive for the listener. So like voice activated competition entries and stuff like that. So that, you know, I can tell I can now tell Alexa what I want to listen to. I don't have to go and try and find the signal with the little knob on the radio. You know, in the UK, people want it easy. We want an easy life. Amazon does great because it's easy. Mm -hmm. You know, so making it easier for listeners and then making it more synonymous with a brand that are advertising just makes it easier. And also I think data is really important because at the minute you know, if I'm listening, obviously it's third party data. So at the minute, I'm getting bombarded with Bumble ads, like every ad break. And I mean, even if I was single, I bloody wouldn't use it now. <laughs> it's every, and I, I think things like that as kind of media, you know, owners need to kind of take that into account because, you know, as planners, everybody here will look at a frequency for an ad and say what's too much. But then because it's digital audio, it seems to kind of fall away a bit because they don't look at it that way, but I'm consuming it that way. Yeah. So from a, yeah, I can look at it from a planning point of view and be like, oh, and from a listener point of view, be like, oh, geez, not again. Um, and it's personalised to Manchester, but I'm still not using Bumble if I'm ever single. <laughs> Sorry if anyone represents Bumble. <laughs> well, I think, I think that the, um, the accountability mm -hmm of digital audio is something which is a yeah. big topic. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you might get average frequency, but do you get the maximum frequency? Because that would be great to know. Um, because, you know, if you're getting it 15 times, no one's going to think that's a good idea. No. So, you know, we can frequency cap to a certain extent, but, you know, th there's a lot to go into in that space. And actually, um, Sam's asked me to plug the panel later, so <laughs> I will do that with Omar. So. Um, at three o'clock, we'll be going into addressability um, within digital audio and um, discussing that in further detail. So because of that, we will go on to some other um, things which we were speaking about. So Kenneth, I know you had a point around uh, podcasting subscription, which I thought was really interesting. So do you mind mentioning that? Uh, for sure. Uh, that is something we have seen at least um, throughout the last couple of years in the, in the Norwegian market and also in the Nordic market um, as such. 
that we are seeing more and more quality podcasts being brought behind the paywall. So behind subscription services, that is also standalone subscri subscription services, but also uh, services that are bundled with, uh, I would say, traditional newspapers and those kinds of offering. Uh, so um, as uh, the advertisement uh, funded podcasts are getting, I would say, uh, poorer and poorer. So almost all of the large and, and quality podcasts are getting uh, put behind a wall. I'm, I, I, I know that that's not the case in, in all markets, mm. but I think it's, a, it's, it's just a reflection of that, uh, the number, the shared number of podcasts being produced and the ability to finance them via advertisement. It's just not adding up. So they are seeking other revenue sources. So that is at least something we are seeing uh, quite strongly in the Nordic markets, and it might, uh, might come to other markets as well, I think. And is that something which other people are noticing in other markets? In Italy, for example, is that? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, well, we, in our experience, in our brand, uh, uh, we are waiting a while to go uh, deeply into this kind of uh, subject. So I mean that about uh, programmatic uh, and this kind of uh, uh, way to sell the radio. And I will try to explain why. We, we believe on, on that. We think that will be useful, will be successful story. But uh, uh, is a beginning moment for this uh, kind of uh, selling that uh, is important to divide uh, the value. So I mean that. I will try to make an example. Uh, you, you have a bag of Hermes, and you know the value of this bag that is uh, uh, not only related to the material, but it related to the context, what is Hermes in the, in the, in the fashion. Uh, if you think about the radio and the brand, you, you, in, our, in our point of view, in a way, uh, we have to, to generate the real value also for this kind of adver advertising that in a way comes from the web. It's something that comes from the web, arrived to the broadcasting, and the value of it, in our personal point of view, now it's a little bit lower, and we would like to set it in the real value, and not, do not have something that, in a way, uh, some, someone, some brand can buy at one price, and can find, obviously, with the number of listeners that is uh, lowest, but using the brand, <coughs> and is so lowest that uh, the value of advertising is not good enough. And so that, that's this point that is critical for us, and we are, we are looking on it. We, we believe on that, but we have to create the real value on that. So uh, someone that talk on the microphone at home and create audio content is good and could have a number, but it's totally different from the content that is created by a co media company. So yeah, the quality is. The quality, the trust, the quality uh, is different. Yeah, definitely agree with I that. I mean, I think in the UK, mm -hmm. there's so much good quality free content available and with a cost of living crisis i can't see you know it's audio is different to a tv subscription or you know a netflix or an amazon prime um yeah I, I don't i personally wouldn't pay for an audio subscription because there's just so much available from media owners you know that are making it readily freely available to me as a consumer um, it's just not something. The only would... exception is probably Spotify, right? Which people you can you can still get it free. Yeah. But it's whether or not you're used to having that yeah. premium mm -hmm. option. Um, I think I think, sorry, that was just in regards to like podcasts. Podcast. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that Spotify fulfills a slightly different need, right? Yeah. yeah. People historically have been used to buying CDs or tapes, and so Spotify is a you're listening to music that you've selected. Whereas with podcasts, it's curated content. It's those yeah. voices. Yeah. So. I agree. I think, I think there's a slight kind of distinction, and I, I agree with Gemma, I, with cost of living, I, I, I don't see how podcasts in the UK particularly will be turning to kind of paid subscriptions for now. Frost. <laughs> <laughs> no one get any ideas. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got five minutes. I've got another question, but if anyone does want to ask a question, please do raise your hand. You all seem quite shy, so I'm going to assume no. Oh, Omara? <laughs> Microphone. Colleague 
Jack, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, somebody made the point, um, it was you, Eugenia, you made the point before about um, radio player and all the radio owners needing to collaborate in order that the technology that people are using with autonomous cars, etc., is going to work for the media owners instead of tech platforms. Um, and it made me think immediately about smart speakers. Has the horse bolted, as it were? Is it too late to solve that problem of radio not being consumed in maybe the way you guys would want to on smart speakers? There's obviously been legislation happening in the UK to try to address some of this, or lobbying for legislation. But as the horse bolter, is there anything more we can do? Kenneth, you're nodding. Yeah, because this is uh, maybe the most important topic uh, for, for European broadcasters and broadcasters everywhere. And, and um, I, I wholeheartedly uh, support Radio Player because we are in a situation where um, uh, big tech companies, or, or at least some of them, are trying to get, uh, be the gatekeepers between the broadcasters and the smart speaker and between the broadcasters and the audience. So, and, and, and the question is, is that window or opportunity to do something with that gone or do we still have it? I think we still have it. I think we can uh, tackle tune-in, but the only way, or just an, as an example of an aggregator, but the only way that we will be able to do that as broadcaster is standing together. So, so that is my uh, biggest thing is distribution control that will be key going forward if we need to you know, protect the bond between the broadcaster and the audience. And um, I, I think you have come really far in UK actually with, with the paper coming out, uh, the review that came out in November, I think. Uh, and, and we are lobbying for the same uh, in other European countries and, and, and we are really pushing for uh, some legislation that will encompass um, must carry and due prominence. But I also think uh, that broadcasters really should take a hard look of uh, if they want to be on aggregators that um, are not um, uh, friendly. Uh, do you want to be on TuneIn, even though uh, it might cost you some listening in the short run? Um, I would say that broadcasters in Europe should really, really take a hard look in that and consider uh, drawing out of TuneIn and other platforms and, and, and come together on one platform that we control ourselves, and that is uh, radio players. So that's a strong... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But this is the most important question, I think. Yeah. Yeah, having the control is definitely important yeah. for transparency of data perspective and so many different reasons. So. Makes absolute sense. Is there anyone else who's got a burning question? Oh, we do have another question, Graham. Hi, really interesting panel. Uh, my name's Adam, I work for Target Spot. Uh, my question specifically to um, Julia, actually. Um, you mentioned, it was really interesting what you were talking about, that your um, um, best performing um, ads and engagement rates from podcasting. Um, do you find a big difference between um, doing a kind of integrated sponsorship style podcast integration versus just pushing in, I don't know, like a programmatic 30 second radio spot ad but in a podcasting environment. And do you, do you measure the difference between the two? And if so, I'd be interested to know um, what those differences are, if there are any. Um, yeah, we've done, a, we've done a bit of measurement. Um, I'd say it's more sort of through a brand lift kind of framework, um, so survey based framework. And I think um, generally speaking, the, the kind of the first sort of integrated podcast probably works a little bit better. I think the results are quite inconsistent. It's hard to measure such a granular sort of tactical um, choice through some of the more holistic frameworks. So yeah, I think, I think the integrated part probably works a little bit better, but um, I think there's still so much to do um, in terms of measuring how, how the outcomes kind of of those types of tactics. Um, that I think we've got a bit of a long way to go to, to truly understand how it performs. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's been our experience so far. I don't know, Gemma, if you've got any... Yeah, I think with anything, even whether it's a podcast or a traditional radio, you, 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 you get more engagement the deeper you make that relationship. So whether it's a sponsorship with some competitions and what we've traditionally called live reads, um, you know, you would always get a better engagement from the customer. But I think alongside that, 
the traditional radio spot will obviously add to that kind of brand building and that kind of a frequency build to kind of give you the whole package. So I think it's you, you're probably doing them both together. Mm. You'd be doing them, but yeah. So I think, to, speaking, yeah, yeah, to try and find that difference, you'd have to do them both in isolation in test periods. And that probably wouldn't be the best of the marketing spend to, to do that kind of testing. Because from a planning point of view, you'd always push kind of the best overall kind of frequency and, and percentage reach from an audio point of view. And adding the digital audio on top of that, the podcasting, kind of just further gives you that cut through that you need. That's an ex excellent point because I definitely think the multiplier effect is. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And I know it's really old school to talk about stuff like that, but it's it's brilliant you know, basics. It is the basics. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's, it's fundamentally what makes audio work for clients. Agree. Um, so I'm afraid we've run out of time, but we've covered a lot of ground. Um, so thank you so much to our fantastic panelists. Um, hopefully you're. Oh, we can clap now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hopefully you do agree that audio has huge potential for the future, is definitely booming at the moment and um, will have a lasting dominance. So, yeah, overall we've, we've looked at so many different things. I think that the main point really is what Kenneth was saying though about, you know, a collective approach from clients, creative agencies, planning agencies, media owners and addressing those potential barriers is going to be the most important thing. So hopefully you can all have that as a takeaway. But yeah, thank you again to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.